It is arguably one of the most powerful offices on the planet. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. America's possibilities are limitless, for we possess all the qualities that this world without boundaries demands. We, the citizens of America, are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. The history of the presidency is one of change. Every four to eight years, someone new comes along and redefines what it means. But some things never change, right? For a very long time, we've looked to the presidency to embody and project our shared national heritage and interests. And I think that we have a president today who is challenging that notion. That's University of Chicago political scientist William Howell. He's one of the leading scholars on the power of the American presidency. Howell has a lot to say about how Trump has redefined the presidency and what his legacy could be. But he also thinks there are larger political conversations that are being overlooked. Trying to engage the public about those questions of longstanding interests is hard because as soon as you say, I'm a political scientist, and as soon as I say, and I study the presidency, it's instantly... You're immediate. Uh, it's all about what's happening right now. From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the stories behind the pivotal research and pioneering breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, William Howell and the power of the presidency. I'm your host, Paul Rand. When you have one of the leading scholars in presidential power sitting across from you, it's tempting to not just dive right into the here and now. But Howell told me right off the bat that it's important to take a step back and understand how the office works broadly before understanding how the Trump presidency fits into that history. I started studying the American presidency as a graduate student in some ways by accident. Okay. And where'd you go to graduate school? I went to Stanford. Okay. And I was casting about for an interesting topic, and I had an interest in issues involving power. And it turns out much of the literature on the presidency at the time— was fixated on the character of the president and all of the efforts of presidents to persuade and bargain with others. And I recognized this sort of basic fact, which is that presidents often do things unilaterally. They just take action and then put the onus on Congress and the courts to offer a response. Um, And when they fail to offer a response, the president wins. Historically, they've been doing it with greater and greater frequency and greater and greater effect. And so this was a feature of the presidency and a presidential power that the literature didn't recognize. So the first thought was, hey, there's an opportunity to make a contribution here. The second piece was I had a longstanding interest in issues involving power. And it was an opportunity to think about how power interacts with other kinds of power, how executive power interacts with legislative and judicial power, and how outcomes are all in the end defined. One of Howell's major contributions to understanding the presidency is his book called Relic. At its heart is a very simple question. Why is our government failing us? Is it political polarization, the increase in money in politics, or do the seeds of our dysfunction go all the way to the Constitution? And could the solution come by actually giving the president even more power? This is a book that reflects upon the capacity of our government to solve problems and suggests that it doesn't do a particularly good job. There are lots of evaluative criteria we might bring to bear when thinking about whether or not the government is performing well. And what we want to think about in particular is, does it solve problems, problems that the public recognizes as the legitimate subject of government action? Okay. And we say, not so much. It doesn't so much. And it doesn't so much because by constitutional design, we have a set of institutions that make it nearly impossible to craft policy solutions that are attentive to the long-term, complex Uh, issues that are national in scope. Um, We have a set of institutions that are set against one another and that puts Congress at the very front and center, which tends to channel parochial short-term interests. Okay. A thrust of, if I'm capturing this right, it also was, I think, somewhat arguing that we ought to give our presidents more power. Yes, in a a particular kind of way. Because whereas Congress channels short-term local interests by design, 
right? by constitutional design. That's not a mistake. It's not that legislators have lost their way. They serve in the House every two years, six in the Senate, and they serve local districts. In order to stay in office, they need to be constantly attentive to local temporary needs. Public, local needs and today's local needs, right? Okay, so the president is different in this regard. The president serves the nation as a whole, not perfectly, but more so than any other elected official, represents the interests of a nation as a whole. And to the extent that legislators are single-minded seekers of re-election, as David Mayhew famously put it, right? They're constantly thinking about the next election. That's, that's, you should have claimed that one. That's a really good line. It's a good line. It it's is a not good line. mine. And it's been around in, <laughs> for a while. It's David Mayhew's. Um, yep. Presidents care deeply about their legacy. They're playing for the ages. They want to leave a mark that endures. Okay. And in that sense, they're very different. They offer a very different kind of leadership than what comes out of Congress. And we need to leverage that in, in important ways. Relic was published in April 2016. Later that year, Howell would have an experience that would shake up many of his views of the presidency, its legacy, and how things may be changing. The election, of course, of Donald Trump. On election night in 2016, I was on the decision desk at ABC News. Okay. And so what the decision desk does is they're the group of kind of data analysts who are looking at past electoral returns, exit polls as they roll in, and precinct level vote returns as they roll in, and try to make predictions about who is likely to win a particular race before all the votes have actually been counted. It became clear around 10 o'clock at night how things were breaking. It is now 11.30 in the East. You hear that chime? We have a projection. It is a big one. It is the state of Florida. 29 electoral votes. They go to Donald Trump. Donald Trump has won the state of Florida, one of his must-win states right there, one of his keys to victory. What was, when, when that happened, and as, as, as a student of the presidency, what thoughts started going, started going through your mind? Either this is going to be fascinating, scary, terrifying, wonderful. For me, I experienced kind of a deep sense of dissonance um, because the work of the decision desk and the work of network television on election night is, a, is the work of prediction. Mm. But I'll say the work of that evening was n not where my head was at. My head was primarily at, we've just had an unbelievably consequential election and it's going to have lots of consequences for our democracy which i think is we, we're observing now okay and is going to shift our politics in really important ways and those kinds of conversations were not a feature of that night frankly they weren't a, a profound feature of the election more generally so much of which is built around this horse race coverage you're studying historical perspectives on presidencies, and, and if we could think about how this president's likely to be remembered, and the chapters are not done being written yet, but if you had to stop today yeah. and say, how's this guy going to be remembered? How, and you were studying him yeah. 10 years out, how, what, what, would that, what would that look like? I, I want to answer in three parts, if I may. Please do. I won't linger too long on any one. Okay. The first part is that there's some things about this president that are perfectly straightforward, which is that he's conservative, and so he has pushed forward successfully tax cuts, and he has pushed forward a deregulation agenda, and he has uh, been a, an important part of appointing all kinds of conservative justices to the judiciary. And so that he's a Republican and that he is conservative has yielded a set of outcomes that are consequential, and that's worth noting. Okay. Point number one. Uh, point number two is that he is a populist, and as a populist, he is pushing back in really important ways on our institutions, on our norms of how we interact with our elected officials. This has had all kinds of implications for areas ranging from diplomacy, international diplomacy, as other countries are trying to figure out what's going on in the United States, to Congress and the Republican Party. What's Right? How are they to manage his interests in imposing tariffs on Mexico, right? And bu in building a wall on the southern border, which they've shown no appetite for in the past, but suddenly they've hitched right their fortunes to his wagon and how to how to manage. And the third thing I'll say is that is, is that the jury's out. That we can't know because a lot hinges upon who gets elected in 2020. Mm. What is to come of the Republican Party? Are we to observe, of course, a correction? Do we look back on this as a moment of kind of spasm, right, where they're just 
freaking out, right? That this is a moment where people who felt ignored are finally having their say, um, but there will be an accommodation and a readjustment in the coming years. Or is this the beginning of an extended period where populists take hold and populist appeals become the norm? We don't know that yet, but a lot about Trump's um, legacy and reputation is going to hinge upon not not just what he does, but how others respond. So if we then look and say, is this a historical blip? And maybe the answer is we don't know. Is this a historical blip or is this going to change the dynamics of how it it must be operating going forward? Yeah. And what, Do you have a sense of that? Well, here's – since serving on that – desk in 2016, I've gotten out of the prediction business. Okay. So I don't know, right? But I will say that there's a very good chance that Trump gets reelected, that there are a set of fundamentals in place. I read something that like leading economists say it is highly likely he'll be reelected. When the economy is performing this well and we're not waging unpopular wars abroad and his approval rating, if anything, is inched upward such that it's now in the low 40s. That bodes well for him. He's not likely to face a meaningful challenge in the primaries. And meanwhile, the Democrats have yet to find their tune. So, yeah, it's it's perfectly probable that he gets reelected in 2020. And depending upon what happens there, I think that's going to set in motion a whole a whole set of things about the future of the Republican Party, what's to happen uh, in terms of U.S. foreign relations. Is it a blip? I think. Uh, a lot rides on the outcome of the 2020 election. It's possible that one of the most defining factors of Trump's presidential legacy will be the debate around impeachment. The history of impeachment and how Trump fits into it after the break. Capitalism is the engine of prosperity. Actually, it sows the seeds of its own demise. Could both be right? I'm Kate Waldock from Georgetown University. And I'm Luigi Zingales from the University of Chicago. We're the hosts of Capitalism, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. We're going to share the sort of irreverent banter you'd hear between economists at a bar. That is, if economists were to go to a bar. Subscribe to Capitalism. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. We are now, and in, in this conversation in many ways leads up to arguably a... a, a pressing question that seems like it, it gains a degree of attention every day in this idea of impeachment. I wonder if we can look back and say, where does the concept of impeachment come from? How was it written into our constitution? How has it played out over the years? And, and what brings us to this door? Boy, uh, that's a loaded question. To say. Yes, there there's okay. lots to say. I mean, you've answered part of it in your question is to say it's embedded in the Constitution. It's a power that's recognized uh, in Article One, And it was seen at the time as a meaningful check on the presidency. Pressed to answer the question, how often do you expect it to see it? They would have answered a lot more than we actually have. We've seen two imper- successful impeachments. Um, 130 years apart in 1868 with Andrew Johnson and in 1998 with Bill Clinton. History unfolding in the nation's capital today as a somber House of Representatives voted for only the second time in American history to impeach a president of the United States. Um, Both of them failed to convict in the Senate. And I think when trying to draw lessons from history vis-a-vis impeachment... A natural place to turn is Nixon's experience. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. And there are two important things to distinguish between then and now, one of which has to do with Fox. The first one is simply that we as a country were not nearly as polarized then as we are now. Yeah. Yep. The second thing is, is that Nixon didn't have in his corner a major media outlet that was backing him at every turn and and and, and speaking exclusively to his base. You right. can't say it any more clearly. No collusion. So now the American people, the answer is in on this. If they want to do this on top of the Green Deal, what are the political right. ramifications for not serving the American people? And offering all kinds of reasons why we need to stick with him. So if what you're waiting for 
in order to move forward on impeachment is a shared reckoning, a shared recognition of the failures of this president. Um, that's harder to do in an era in which you have a major cable news source squarely in the president's camp. We've not found a new trove of compromising documents. There's no blurry iPhone video in which the president swears fealty to Vladimir Putin. One more note, please. Which is that um, the politics, it's possible that the politics may shift over the course of impeachment hearings. If you look in the spring of 1973, when we look back on, we're used to thinking about Watergate. The country came together and was completely against uh, Nixon. And there was this moment of reckoning that Democrats and Republicans alike shared in and a corrective was offered. Not so much. In the spring of 1973, all of 19% of the American public thought Nixon should have been removed, should be removed from office. Over the court, and that's, and that's when um, hearings are launched on, on the Watergate burglary. For the next year and a half, that number jumps up to eventually getting to as high as 58%. Two things to note. One is big changes in public opinion by virtue of holding these hearings and fixing the media's attention and by extension the public's attention on a set of crimes and misbehaviors committed by the president and those who, who, who serve him. Point number one. Point number two is it got only up to 58%. It wasn't that the country, that, that, that overwhelming supermajorities recognized that he needed to be removed. It got as high as 58%. And then Nixon stepped down. And so it's possible that in holding hearings today that not all members, but some members of the public may change and that some Republicans, five or ten in the Senate, might shift their opinions. And in, if that's true, then it starts to really take hold. Let's go back two and a half years when you still thought you could predict things. Mm. Um, what's your prediction for what this whole thing shakes out, the impeachment issues in 2020? Oh, having just promised not to make prediction, <laughs> you're coming back at me. All right, what's it going to happen? So here's here's what I think are the most likely scenarios. Okay. Um, the Democrats don't move forward on impeachment, but that they continue to hold lots of hearings and that the field eventually winnows on the Democratic side and that the Democrat wins and whoever that might be wins in 2020, but that the challenges that Trump presents to our politics persist. I think this is an important piece, which is that even if Trump gets doesn't get reelected, and look, it's basically a coin flip at this point. My guess is I give the slight edge to the Democrats in 2020, but that the Democrats would do well to attend to those deeper structural sources of anger and disaffection. And that requires institutional reform. It requires a lot of policy action. It requires them not simply arguing that they're going to present a return to normalcy. There needs to be a sense of urgency in their governance. Because even if we don't have Trump from 2020 to 2024, there's no reason why Trump 2.0 might emerge then. And that Trump could well be much more disciplined um, and much even more authoritarian than the Trump we've been living under the last two and a half years. In any era, the debates around impeachment cut beyond just the sitting president. They're often wrapped up in the underlying political forces and structures that drive our politics. What those are and how Howell thinks they need to change after the break. If you're listening to Big Brains, there's a good chance you consider yourself a lifelong learner. However, you may not know about the University of Chicago's Graham School and its focus on continuing liberal and professional studies. For more than a century, Graham has been a destination for lifelong learners. They offer courses online and in the classroom, bringing the transformative education U Chicago is known for to students of all ages. To learn more about the courses, certificates, and degrees, visit graham.uchicago.edu. Howell says it's hard to be a political scientist in the age of Trump. There's all sorts of conversations to be had about the structural issues and instability in our political system. But all anyone wants to talk about is Trump. So let's put the president aside for just a moment. So there, there, are, there are a lot of things that I'd like to uh, talk about. Let me talk about one in particular, which is a central theme of the book that I wrote in 2016. And we're writing a follow-up to which will be coming out uh, next year. 
we meaning my co-author Terry Moe from Stanford and I, um, and that is to think about institutional reform in the service of effective government, to think about the ways in which we might change our governing institutions so that we stand a fighting chance of enacting policy that is coherent, that is relevant, that stands a chance of attending to the very real sources of dislocation and anxiety. Think about rising inequality between the rich and the poor, a warming climate. How do we attend to population movements from the global south to the global north in a very real and responsible way? To my mind, we don't have a set of institutions that are adequately uh, equipped to address these kinds of issues. And it's hard to have conversations about institutional reform when you have a personality like Trump in office and all the attention turns to him and his outsized personality. But, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, there was a long-term effort in this country under the progressive movement to think long and hard about institutional reform in the service of effective government. Um, and that took the form of, in part, a more powerful presidency, but also um, get, uh, introduction of the civil service reform, um, the rolling out of referenda. I don't want to suggest that these are the right reforms that we need today, but they were they managed – we as a country manage in fits and starts to have those hard conversations about how we should rework our politics, not how do we kind of preserve – the institutional design of our founders, but how do we rework that design in the service of the challenges that we face today? It's really hard to have those conversations mm -hmm. today. In his last book, Relic, Howell argued that in order to fix the dysfunction in our government, we need to expand the power of the presidency. Given his reactions to our current president, could that possibly still be the case? Oh, yes. We address this issue head on in, in, our, in, a, in the new book. In Relic, we identified a particular kind of power that we wanted to give the president, which had to do with increased agenda setting power, to give the power, that give the president the ability to introduce legislation within Congress and to force legislators within Congress to vote on the proposal. They're free to vote it down, but they have to vote. And if they don't, it automatically becomes law. That's a serious power to give the president, but it's in the service of enlivening the legislative process. It's in the service of trying to force legislators to grapple with hard systemic problems in ways that they decidedly are not today. And it's not about increasing the president's unilateral powers or strengthening the hand of a demagogue. To my mind, there are some powers that the president already has that do have those effects, and those should be curtailed, and we talk about this in the book. The president's ability to politicize primarily the Justice Department is deeply problematic. The president's pardon power is deeply problematic. Um, and the president's unilateral powers are a mixed bag. On the one hand, they provide presidents opportunities to offer corrections and, and intervene in um, local challenges about how we should be implementing vague statutes enacted by Congress, and that that's important. We need that on the one hand. On the other hand, there are all kinds of ways in which unilateral powers quite clearly, can be abused. And so those we need to think long and hard about. So the argument here is not that presidents always deliver and that all that is good and great flows through the White House. Decidedly not. But it is an effort to try to think about how we can best leverage the unique kinds of leadership that in our politics today flow from the White House, that attention to national interests, that attention to long-term consequences of policy change. If you're going to, where are you going to find leadership on something like climate change if not through the presidency? That's not to say that all presidents will provide that leadership or that the kinds of solutions that they'll offer will be effective solutions, but that's our best shot in our politics. And that, and that if what we're going to do is just shut down the White House um, for, uh, for fear of another Trump coming into office is to miss the very reason why Trump got elected into office, which is that we have a government that's failed to attend to lots of profound challenges that we as a country face. I'm going to give one final question. <clears throat> Let's back back mm -hmm. um, from George Washington on. You have the power to bring back any one of our presidents to deal with the issues that we have today. Who would you choose and why? 
Oh gosh, who do you choose and why? So the two obvious ones are FDR and Lincoln. Lincoln simply because he is, to my mind, to most scholars' mind, the greatest president that we've had. Um, the the he preserves the union in ways that are attentive to the deep challenges of separation of powers. Um, he's our most profound president. Um, with FDR, though, what you get is a president who's perfectly willing to experiment, to try things out, to roll out initiatives um, in the service of jump-starting change for him in response to the Great Depression. Can we combine the two of them? Sure. And have a president who is both attentive to issues of constitutional design and institutional design and who can assess this particular challenges of this moment and who also will act and act and act as FDR did. That's the kind of, I think, president that we need, albeit one that is monitored and checked and sometimes stopped in his, hopefully a her, tracks um, by Congress and the courts as, as need be. Let's see if the next one matches up to this. Big Brains is a production of the U Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. Our show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap. Thanks for listening. <laughs>